Hello, hey everybody. Welcome. Welcome to everybody in the chat. Great to see members Hill here as well. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much to my mods today. Dip Me in Glitter is here. I think my Tony might be here or popping in as well. Truly appreciate your help. Wonderful to see everybody. Welcome. I'm Natalie. This is Scientology Life After a Cult, where we talk about the different ways that the internet loses their mind in all the good ways about Scientology. We talk about that news that comes out, everything from protests to Scientology scandals to across the board. If it's related to Scientology and you guys are interested in talking about it, we are talking about it. Now, today I'm doing one of my favorite things, which is interviewing people in the different community of ex-Scientologists, people who are protesting. If you have questions as we go along, could you just go ahead and put question in all caps and have your question follow? That will help me keep an eye on those so that we can answer as many of those as we can today. Please do me another solid and hit that like button on your way in. And check your subscribe button as well. I appreciate that. I know that when people like the video coming in, it does help us get out notifications. I'm pretty sure that works. It seems to. I'm going with it. All right. Today, I'm interviewing somebody who some might say is a bit of a controversial figure in the community of ex-Scientologists and exposing Scientology. And we're going to learn a bit about what he's doing in the UK. We'll touch on the Paris protests as well that just happened for Scientology. And if you have questions, like I said, put the word question in front, have your question follow, and we'll see if we can't get to as many of those as we can. So I want you all to welcome here Apostate Alex. Yay. Hi, Natalie. How's it going? Fabulous. Hello and a hip hip hooray to you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Glad that you're here. We This is our first time meeting and our first time chatting. And um, I have so many questions. But the first thing I want to ask about, because it just happened, was to touch on a little bit about the Paris protests and the opening of the Scientology organization in Paris. And the biggest question for me, I think, and you, you've you talked about this already, and I've seen other people talk about it too, is that it did appear that David Miscavige was not at the actual opening, but pre-taped a thing, did, a, did some type of briefing, briefing prior, and you came up with some receipts that kind of backed that up. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, so my theory, and it is just a theory at this point, my theory is that Dave Miscavige visited Paris Org the week before on the 30th of March um, and gave a speech, it was recorded, and then it was played at the opening event on the 6th of April because, um, you know, I was tracking Tom Cruise's jet and helicopters and all this sort of stuff, and we all know Dave Miscavige travels a lot in Tom Cruise's jet, and on Saturday the 30th of March, it made a quick hop from London to Paris and it was there for six hours and flew back, which is the perfect time, you know, considering how close the airport is to the org for him to just make a quick visit and inspection. Um, things like the photos of the talk that Miscavige gave, for example, everyone that attended the Paris opening um, got a little IES badge with like a French flag on it. No one in the audience in the pictures of Dave Miscavige's speech was wearing those badges. But on the day, because I was there, everybody was wearing them. And there's a few other things like that that kind of add up to make me believe that he wasn't there. I mean, you know, I was outside and we saw the ribbon pulling event. He didn't pull the, the rope to cut the ribbon, which he does at every other ideal org opening. And I don't see a world in which Miscavige was there on the day and gave a speech in person, but then didn't pull the rope to officially open the org because that's, you know, never happened before. So there's a couple of things like that that just don't add up in my head. And if you, I, I did a bit of a dissection of the press release and the wording, and I think they were very careful in the way they talked about Miscavige at, on the day and his speech. And so, yeah, my theory is that he is a bit of a coward and was scared to be there on the day because he knows that France is not the most Scientology friendly country. Um, and so he did what he could to fly under the radar. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Why do you think? Because he seems to definitely not like to show his hand, right? Even if he was worried about something, he would do something stupid anyways. But do you think it is because he is? in trouble in Paris. Like if like that he would actually, I don't know how it works there with being served and things like that in Paris, but that where there would actually be someone there to serve him with papers. Do you think that was part of it? I mean, 
I'm not aware of any outstanding warrant for his arrest or mm -hmm. cases against him in France. However, yeah. he's only ever missed two other ideal org openings in history, and that's Russia and Germany, who are both uh, countries that have got a history of being pretty anti-Scientology. France is another country that, you know, they officially declared Scientology a sect, which is the French word for cult. They've convicted Scientology of fraud on more than one occasion. The local residents, 30,000 of them, signed a petition to try and prevent the opening of the org. You know, they're not wanted in that area, and Miscavige is certainly not going to be uh, going to receive a warm welcome from from Parisians. So I think there's a lot of risk there. And I think that considering the history of, you know, Heber Gentsch, when he arrived in, I think it was Spain or Germany or something, he was arrested the moment he got there. Mm. I think he was scared and, you know, he needed to make an appearance, but he didn't want to make his um, presence known in advance for um the the fear of being served or arrested or whatever so he flew in gave a speech that was recorded flew out under the radar before anyone even noticed um and then he could still make scientologists believe he was there and have a presence and open the org um mm. but not have that risk of of any sort of repercussions that's my theory at least but i never worked with dave miscavige i was never up in in the sea org or over in the states so like this is just my theory based yeah, on what yeah. I've witnessed and researched. I could be completely wrong, but um, a couple of people who have worked with Miscavige directly have kind of backed up the theory. So, but we'll see, you know, who knows? Yeah, it makes sense because you're right. I don't see him missing an opening, missing an opportunity to be in front of a camera and pulling down the ribbon mm -hmm. as he loves to do. That just, that does not add up at all. So I, I think you're right about that. It does look that way. And if you back that up, like you're saying, with the records of Tom Cruise's airplane coming and going about that time where he could have gone in and done a quick briefing because it was in the building in the new Paris yep. Scientology organization building because it looked like they have a they must have an event hall. Yeah, like an auditorium. It's quite large. Also, considering, you know, when we had the IS protest back in November, there are a specific group of OSA security guards that follow Miscavige around. And they're very recognizable in the UK and Europe because they have American accents. Um, and there were a handful of Americans there for sure on um, on Saturday in Paris. But that kind of intense OSA security presence just simply wasn't there on Saturday that we have seen at other events that Miscavige has attended. So there's a lot of reasons that make me believe he wasn't there. I mean, I think we would have known if he was there. We were there on the ground outside the building. Um, but yeah, I think yeah. The, the reason it's important is it shows how scared Miscavige is and how I think it's also important to maybe set an example to other governments around the world that if you stand up to Scientology and you don't take their rubbish, I'm trying not to swear, um, you know, you you can actually affect change. And you, what you've done is made Miscavige scared to, you know, arrive in your country, which is great. So I'm hoping other governments see that and, and don't back down to the bully organization that is the Church of Scientology. Yeah, and take a stronger stance on it for sure. Yeah. Absolutely, for sure. Now, you are you from you're from the UK, born and raised there. Yeah. Yep. All right. Tell me about how did you how did you get into Scientology? You mentioned you weren't in the Sea Organization. Hmm. Yeah. So I was a teenager. I was going through like a vulnerable moment in my life i had a lot of moving and changing around as a kid and went to five different schools and you know had a lot of deaths in different like every year in school um someone that i knew passed away and so there was a lot of trauma and vulnerability and that sort of thing and you know scientology came along at just the right moment because they prey on people with vulnerabilities and um you know i'd heard a little bit about scientology and I'd seen the second BBC Panorama documentary that John Sweeney was in, which looks at fair game. It doesn't look at Scientology's belief system because that was covered in the first mm -hmm. episode, which I didn't see. Um, and the second one, I saw John Sweeney shouting at this, you know, at, at Tommy Davis. And I was like, mm, this guy's probably not completely unbiased if he's shouting and screaming. So maybe he's trying to make Scientology look as bad as he can because he's, you know, angry at them for whatever reason but it wasn't that i saw that and thought sign me up i saw that and i thought 
these guys, whatever they believe in, are defending it with like, you know, so much passion. I've never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested to know why, like, what is it they believe in and why are they defending it so, so vehemently? And how on earth have they got a well-respected BBC journalist to react in that way? Like mm -hmm. it's something, something's going on here. And I'm not the sort of person that thinks you should believe everything you read in the media at face value you should find out for yourself and so I went and did a personality test and kind of you know just to find out what is it you believe in and you know I'd saw a few seen a few Scientology adverts that kind of piqued my interest in the kind of if you're looking for answers and a sense of belonging and you know if you've got trauma in your life you know Scientology yeah. can help you with that and you know instability and all these things that I was going through as a teenager you know because I was a kid um you know they provided those answers and and planted enough of a doubt in my head that maybe what I saw in the BBC Panorama documentary or what I'd read online wasn't quite as it seems you know maybe you know, if you see, this is one of the things they said to me is like, if you look at restaurant reviews, you know, you see really good reviews and really bad reviews because no one needs a review that says, yeah, it was okay. You know, yeah. so they kind of said that maybe, you know, there's a couple of people who had a bad experience in America, but it's not like that here in the UK. And they plant enough of a seed of doubt in your mind that you think, okay, well, what's the harm in buying a book or doing a course and yeah. seeing how I feel? And that's kind of how it, how it all started. And, and next thing you know, I was sucked in and you know, I know now that I'm an adult <laughs> to uh, not walk into a church of Scientology. Yeah. But, how how did they, because you said you were, how old were you? 15. 15. So did, when you joined staff, because it's it's different in England, probably from the United States, did your parents have to sign off on the, on the staff contract? They were supposed to, but they didn't. So I, when I joined Scientology, I was 15 and I turned 16 in April and in the UK, it's changed now. But at the time you finish school at the age of 16 mm -hmm. and then you have a two year optional college or sixth form, which you then do till you're 18 and then you start university. But you can leave school at 16. Um, now it's changed. I think you can only leave when you're 18. But at the time, you know, you turn 16, you finish school. And then if you want to, you can go about and start a career and stuff. But you're still technically a child until you're 18. So it was that weird kind of time in my life where I'm thinking, what am I going to do with my life? You know, am I going to, you know, go to sixth form or college? Am I going to become a lawyer? Because that's what I was interested in at the time. Yeah. And so, yeah, I joined staff as soon as I finished my exams in the May, I think it was. And I said to them, look, my family fully expects me to go back to sixth form, go to college in September. Um, and I'm not really fussed. I'm enjoying my time here in Scientology. I'm enjoying this. And, you know, I'm still living at home, so I don't need to earn loads of money. So it's OK to volunteer. Um, so if we can handle my family to be OK with me not continuing my, continuing my education, um, then I'm more than happy to stay on staff. But if we don't handle my family, then I will have to leave in September. Um, and they were like, OK, well, you know, we've got to get our stats up, sign the contract, sign the contract. So I'd signed the contract and it came to September and we didn't manage to handle my family. So I had to leave and, and go back to go back to school. And then I rejoined staff later. Later on after. So you finished school. You, it was two years, right? You had to do two years. Yeah. So September, I went back to school. I started sixth form or college, as it's called here, which is where you do your A-levels. And then I was still... It, kind of practicing Scientology, doing extension courses. And then I was um, kicked out officially kind of in the October, just before the IES event, which we'll touch on later, I'm sure. And then when I, I did my sixth form those two years, and then I rejoined as soon as I finished my A-levels in the summer of what year would that have been? 2013. Um, Cause I'd finished around May of that time and had managed to sort out through a board of review why I was kicked out the first time that was handled. I rejoined um, staff and then carried on and then was posted as director of public book sales. And then eventually was kicked out and declared a potential trouble source. Was that related to the first time that they kicked you out? No. It was, what did they tell you? I mean, I, usually it's like it, if it, well, in the C organization, there's like a fitness board and then you get kicked out on staff. Sometimes they might do some type of Scientology justice action, or was it just kind of a, like, here's your, your PTS type, your potential trouble source declare. 
Yeah. So I had an, like ethics interviews and had to do an OW write up. And then it was, I was literally doing my OW write up and they, I gave it to the ethics officer. He just glanced at it, put it on the table and then handed me my PTS declare that had been there the whole time, <laughs> my staff dismissal, and then escorted me to my desk in the door. But essentially I was complaining that Scientology wasn't helping me and that I was upset and I just wanted Scientology to work. And it, I was complaining too much. Um, so yeah so and then you... they gave me a return program and i carried on doing extension courses for a couple of years afterwards and was still a scientologist to try to get back into good graces but then kind of drifted away so when they gave you initially it was like okay you can't be on staff because you're a pts type a potential trouble source did they specifically say which one because there are multiple ones yeah, PTS type D, which is responsible for condition case. So you can bring up the certificates if you want. I shared them with you. In yeah, the, let me the grab. You, you know what? I've I shared think... them on my channel as well before in the past. But um, responsible for condition case is essentially it's like, yeah, I was complaining of all of the, uh, you know, Scientology was responsible for all of my, um, you know, upsets in life. And in fact, there we go. That's it. You know, mm -hmm. Alex Barnes is hereby declared a potential trouble source type D. That's right. Whoops. And LRH says, let's see. Whoop. I'm having trouble with my Zoom. <laughs> Responsible for condition cases have been traced back to the other causes for their condition too often to be acceptable. By responsible for condition cases is meant the person who insists a book or some auditor is wholly responsible for the terrible condition I am in. Such cases demand unusual favors, free auditing, tremendous effort on the part of auditors. Review of these cases show they were in the same worst condition long before auditing that they are using a planned campaign to obtain auditing for nothing, that they are not as bad off as they claim, and that their antagonism extends to anyone who seeks to help them. So then it says it was found that Alex has been complaining of not receiving gains from auditing that he has that he had, and he was in fact getting worse. He also remarked that he had he had to change his life for Scientology, not Scientology changing his life. Alex also expressed that there was no point to continue in Scientology if it didn't work on him. He later stated after receiving some help from Qual, and that's the qualifications division, that after studying some basics, he felt invalidated and worse. Should Alex wish to handle this declare, he can get through a program that has been laid out by the org given to him. So they basically didn't even, I mean, you sat down there and this was already printed up and ready to go. And they were basically saying like, well, you don't make any gains in Scientology, so you have to go. And you were yeah. saying you really wanted it to work. Like you sold how, what was that like to have in your head where I want this to work? You're selling these Dianetics books, right? You're, you know, trying to recruit people for Scientology, but you yourself weren't actually getting any wins or gains out of it. Yeah, I mean, so a bit of context. Like, so the first time I was kicked out, um, it was just before the IES event in October. And the whole plan was to bring my mum along to the IES event because I was trying to not recruit her, but to get her to be okay with me, you know, joining Scientology. And the the program was there's a whole program in place of like how to do that. And it was like, well, bring her along to the IES event. You can and she can see all of the good work that we're doing and in hindsight, it probably, you know, the IES event is very culty and probably actually would have made it worse. But essentially, she had a distant connection to um, an SP, basically. Mm -hmm. And so the DSA, Director of Special Affairs of London Org, called me up like the night before, or I think it was the night before, and said, hey, Alex, you can't come to the IES event um, because you've got this connection and, you know, we can't, you can't do any services. Until yeah, what that. was the connection in, this, in the States? I think it might be a little bit different in the US. Like, you can't have somebody who works for the IRS or works for the FBI. How does that work in the UK? What was the connection that they found so yeah. horrible? See, that's the thing. And like, and this was found out with the board of review when I rejoined, like it was never found out who the connection, like what the actual problem was, because I, my understanding is that my mum had like spoken to like a colleague or a family member or someone about me joining Scientology. And they had suggested, you know, they've got 
a connection i don't know if it's a family member or a colleague or whatever that was that had had a bad experience in scientology and would you like to speak to them to get a, a balanced view on yeah. scientology and that was the extent of it my mum never met this person i don't know who the person was but obviously me being a good scientology kid reported that to scientology i said look my mum's got this connection to someone who's had a bad experience like how do we handle that because i want to yeah. stay on staff um so they phoned me up and said that I can't go to the IS event and, you know, we need to sort this situation out and you can't do any servicing until we figure out who this connection is and how much of a threat they are. Um, and then that was never followed up and that, there was never an investigation. And so when I got back in touch with the org after Flag picked me up to do my basics by extension course, they suggested I did a board review. So we did that. And again, I shared the document with you. The board review came back and said, you know, it was an injustice that the DSA shouldn't have barred you from services and kicked you out because it was never found out who the SP was. And there was never an investigation. And, you know, you're welcome back. So I went back. Yeah. Um, but all of that this is a really long winded way of answering your question. Um, all of that was like, traumatizing for me as a kid because I was all of that sort of trauma I'd had beforehand of like losing friends and you know moving around a lot and I was looking for answers and a sense of belonging and I'd made all these friends over summer and like this camaraderie of like we're on a mission and we're all united and we're all happy all the time and it's great and like upstand theta and like I love that element of it and so suddenly for those people overnight to stop talking to you um was quite upsetting so when i went back after the board of review um i was upset and i was like look guys i'm I'm still upset about what happened and i don't want that to happen again so i was kind of really pushing for um tech to be applied and you know i went into an arc break session which is a type of auditing that's meant to handle upsets and i came out of that session feeling worse and i was crying and i was upset and i made a bit of a fuss and i was like look auditing is meant to make you feel better it's meant to raise you on the tone scale mm -hmm. and this is not raising me on the tone scale I'm, I'm worse now than i was before i went in so i red tagged and um, which means i went back in the following day and just because i kicked up a fuss and i was saying like look things like this happened before i was kicked out and i you know i think there was an injustice i'm just really nervous and worried that that's going to happen again i just want scientology to work for me because I was really enjoying my time and, you know, I'm really good at book selling and I'm enjoying my time here and it's having fun and all exciting. And I feel like I've finally got a sense of purpose and belonging and a reason I'm here. I'm doing good for the planet. And um, I was terrified of that being taken away from me because that's what happened in my upbringing is, you know, lots of things like that. So I was just in this place of, of panic and terrified. And so, yeah kicked up a fuss and they turned that into me complaining of no case gain and and everything you just read in the declare yeah did you think that at that time that they would do an investigation or go further there was a two-year period you said where really they didn't they didn't take it any further right like mm -hmm. jersey in fact's question is i thought once they kick you out you're out they don't investigate and they did they kicked you out and didn't investigate but then flag the flag land base must have come in on on a tour of sorts and said no it was it was over the phone so they were just doing like a um what you call it, like recovery cycle so they were i was on their cf for whatever reason and so they called me up and they were like hey you know you want to buy your basics books and lectures and i was like oh well funny you should call because this is what happened and yeah. so the person at flag helped me helped me um figure out what went on and they because I was very green so I didn't really know Scientology ethics or anything and they said oh you should request a board of review and you know I bought my basics and I started doing extension courses with them and then they put me in touch with the Continental Justice Chief and then that was all kind of resolved with the help of FLAG. Yeah but then it didn't totally resolve it sounds like right yeah. they ended up just kind of not even after the board of review so they do that and they go okay well turns out there's nothing nobody can come up with a connection that your mom had they didn't allow you back on staff though yeah they did so i think i was i may have already been no i wasn't on staff when i did the board of review but yeah I, they let me straight as soon as that board of review came out they were like yeah no that's fine okay cool because it was an injustice you shouldn't have been kicked out here you know welcome back essentially yeah but as a public person as a like a yeah. member of scientology and that that coincided with me finishing school the sixth form college is when i was 17 18 and because it coincided with that i almost basically went straight back onto staff because 
I'd not completed my staff contract the first time because I had to leave to go back to school. So it's kind of like, well, I still have an obligation here to fulfill my staff contract. Um, so as soon as I was able to, I rejoined staff straight away and was posted in Div 6, which is the public facing division. Did they count your earlier time on staff towards your, because usually <laughs> there's about a two, is it, I always forget, is it two and a half, it's a two and a half year contract or a yeah. five year contract? Yes. Yeah. And they, they didn't count the month from before. It was a new contract. <laughs> Did you have to sign a new two and a half year contract? Yeah. yeah. Did you ever sign a Sea Org contract, the billion year contract? Yeah. So I was like, you know, super gung ho at this. Once the border review happened, I instantly felt like I was like, okay, oh, finally, I'm back in this place that, you know, everyone's united to try and help people. And, you know, I'm doing good things for the planet. And, you know, I'm loving the going out and sending books and all of this. So, like, I was like fully in it and um, yeah, I was recruited and like signed my seal contract and there was a project prepare, like, okay, how do we get you to arrive at flag? And um, you know, there was a step-by-step -step process and um, you know, we were pretty much there. I just needed to find a replacement to replace me on staff so that I could leave my contract early um, mm -hmm. at London org um, and sort my visa out. And then I would have been on a plane, but luckily uh, that never happened. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah. It's fascinating, too, that you you had such a passion and desire to stay and be part of that. But during that time, you really weren't having the wins or the gains from Scientology, which kind of led to getting that board of review and all of that. How did you maintain that that desire to be there, even though when you're doing Scientology, it's like you're already not getting the wins and the gains from it? Yeah, I think that that's the cognitive dissonance, isn't it? You know, that's the way Scientology works in in your mind and you don't you don't you you kind of disconnect and compartmentalize in your brain so i didn't put two and two together you know i was a child don't forget so i'm not fully neurologically developed and so there's also that element but also the element of my upbringing and trauma i had from my um from like uh, before i joined scientology moving around and like not having friends for very long because I moved schools all the time and all of this yeah. and so I was yearning for like a sense of purpose and belonging mm. and stability because I never stayed in you know one place for too long so there was this opportunity here where all these people are gaslighting me and making me feel valued and respected and you know we're trying to do great things here and you know that all lined up with what I was looking for in that vulnerable state of of my teenage years and so if there was one or two things that were upsetting in that period, yes, but I was kind of trying to not focus on that. And like the, the gains and the benefits in my mind were all of those things I was looking for in life at the time that I hadn't had previously. Yeah. A lot of people that's often the case where they're looking for community and connection and that mm -hmm. sense of belonging. And part of pretty much any cult is that love bombing and make you feel a part of it yeah. until in Scientology, as you work your way in and as they get their tentacles around you and they tighten, your world becomes smaller with who you can communicate with and, and all of that. How did you end up eventually then leaving Scientology? Yeah. So when I was kicked out as and declared PTS, I was still like that wasn't it's not an SP declare. So it's not like I'm completely pers persona non grata. I had a yeah. return program and the, initially that was to do the entire basics books and lectures course, you know, extension courses from start to finish, which would have taken like three years. Um, and extension courses, for those of you who don't know, is when you study at home and you do the answers, the questions and do the course online and submit your answers. Um, and the idea is you do that and then we'll review your situation and maybe you can come back, you can make amends. Um, and so there was a while where I was petitioning to try and reduce my um, return program and the Continental Justice Chief down at St. Hill got involved and it was reduced to like three extension courses. And I just like carried on with that and was still practicing from home, practicing, you know, reading books and doing courses and stuff. But at the same time, I was at that point 18, 19 years old. So I was then starting university. I only did a year and then I left and then started a different course later on. But that kind of formative coming into adulthood years, I was there's lots of change. I was doing new things in my life, meeting new people. And I just kind of gradually drifted away. Mm -hmm. um, the last lesson I ever submitted 
on extension course was 2018 but i probably stopped considering myself a scientologist around 2016 because it was about then that i stopped doing it full time and really trying to get back in good graces and because that by that point it had been two years of not being there all day every day being indoctrinated and surrounded by the love bombing i just kind of gradually drifted away but still had that doubt in my mind until yeah about 2018 um was when i did my last lesson had had what doubt what no it, it was a lesson on extension course so it was oh okay. no you had a course. doubt you still had that doubt in your mind oh yeah the doubt of like you know well i had a bad experience but maybe yeah. it's because it wasn't because in scientology if it's not applied correctly that's the only reason it doesn't work so yeah. maybe it's just because it's not been done correctly or maybe my trauma or what happened to me was bad but maybe there's you know something good in there and you know all of these people wouldn't be there all the time being happy if it wasn't helping them and i did have good times in scientology so maybe it's worth pursuing maybe it's not as bad as it seems you know that doubt is is what yeah. was playing on on my mind so when did you when did you get involved in speaking out about scientology or protesting scientology um about 18 months ago so i like moved on with my life having not um you know, really thought about it and all of that like i said that doubt up until 2018 i was still really uncomfortable like reading anything about scientology and if it ever came up in conversation or i was watching something on tv i would always skip it because i just didn't want to confront it in my mind and then it was about 18 months ago um that i was having a disagreement with a friend and in that disagreement i realized i was still applying scientology techniques without realizing it you know i was trying to basically change this guy on the tone scale and manipulate these emotions and you know i realized in the moment that, that i was doing that instinctively without realizing and so i started that um you know going down that rabbit hole of like wow for some reason i've just realized i'm still doing something this is scientology technique and so started unpacking that and then you know, next thing you know, I found YouTube, I Googled Scientology for the first time and like started reading all these horror stories and um, and yeah, then was interviewed on Chris Shelton's channel and then started my own YouTube channel and kind of found it important to share stories on YouTube and then became I still probably started considering myself an activist around September, October of last year when I started planning the IS protest. Up until then, I was just trying to share experiences on YouTube and help people recover, I suppose. Yeah, that is a that is a big way to jump into it is just right at the IS event with, with <laughs> it's, a, it's a big event in Scientology. Yeah. That is a good one to cut your teeth on and get involved <laughs> that way. So you're there, you're protesting at the IS event, you're doing your YouTube channel, you're making inroads where you live and raising awareness about Scientology being a human trafficking cult, and you're doing those things. And uh, let's kind of jump forward to the, and th let's, let's talk about Stephanie Hutchinson's blog article. Mm -hmm. So, which we have, I just have a couple questions on that. Let's see, I'm going to stop sharing that. And you and I talked about it a little bit in that the way, so here's my question. So this is Stephanie Hutchison. For those who don't know, this is from her blog called Confront and Shatter, Exposing the Truth About Scientology. And this is an article that came out at the end of March, which was destroyed by any means necessary. And she, she, she brings you up in this, which is why I'm asking you about it, because she talks about, you know, gives this quote by L. Ron Hubbard, which Alex, I'm sure you're familiar with where he talks about how if, if there will be a long-term threat, you are to immediately evaluate and originate a black PR campaign to destroy the person's repute and to discredit them so thoroughly that they will be ostracized. It's L. Ron Hubbard. And she's talking about how Aaron Smith Levin at Growing Up in Scientology during one of his YouTube live streams, he commented about you. Okay, so here this part. Alex is a former Scientologist who joined in 2011 for reasons that the cult never made clear, Ross was kicked out in 2014. However, he continued to take extension courses with the last being in 2018. I mean, that's that's slightly incorrect because that's like I said, just explained my story. It wasn't clear why I was kicked out the first time. When I was mm -hmm. kicked out in 2014, it was clear because that was the PTS declare and everything, right? So that that bit was slightly a slight error, but sorry, just yeah, wanted to did, clarify did, that point. Yeah, let me ask you this. Did Stephanie Hutchison interview interview you at all or speak to you about this? 
No, so the day before the article went out, she messaged me and she said, hey, Alex, just out of interest, um, what years were you in Scientology? And I said 2011 till about 2014 and answered that question. She said, okay, thank you. And did you know Aaron Smith Levin when you were in? And I was like, no, I mean, he was over in the States and I was here in the UK. I first came across him on YouTube. And she was like, okay, thank you. And I was like, okay, that's a bit weird, but whatever. And then next thing I know, there's this article out on online. And so I didn't know it was going to happen. I didn't ask her to do it. And, you know, I think ultimately that we live in a world where there's free speech, right? And, you know, I think everyone is entitled to their own opinion. And that's the beauty of blogging and YouTube is that we have this platform to say whatever we want. And people can agree with it, disagree with it, whatever. Um, but I think what's important is that, the narrative that's being played that I was somehow involved in it or asked for it or whatever, that's, that's not true. You know, Stephanie off her own back did this article and bless her. She was trying to defend me in a way which I didn't ask for or feel was necessary. Um, but you know, there are things that people agree with things that disagree with, you know, Aaron's done videos that are negative about me. Um, I haven't, I've never responded to them apart from this one video I did the other week. Um, and, you know, I just kind of go, well, that's his opinion. He's welcome to have his own opinion. We don't all have to agree. And I'm never going to try and silence people for saying stuff that's positive or negative about me, because that's the beauty of this platform. So, you know, it, people are entitled to whatever they want to believe. I don't think it was helpful, um, you know, and obviously there was a lot of backlash off the back of that. Um, but this narrative that I was somehow involved in the creation of the story or asked her to do it is, is just completely false. And on my channel, I focus specifically on uh, telling people stories, on updating people on my activism and shining a light on the abuse that's currently going on right now, specifically at St. Hill here in the UK, and trying to raise awareness and lobby government and do all of that sort of stuff. And that's my focus. And I'm not a channel that will comment on drama or like infighting or whatever you want to call it. There are plenty of channels that do that. And I think that's very valid and welcome. We need to have those discussions and debate. Um, but that's not the purpose of my channel. So that's why I haven't kind of responded to it. Um, yeah. Why do you why do you think that? Because the way that this goes on, you know, like you said, it really it kind of dragged you into it because she's making points about which are great. The work that you've done in the UK with the protesting and like that would have been such a great article all by itself because she does talk about Barnes Ross organized an amazing protest against cult of Scientology in East Grinstead and has effectively thrown a huge wrench into the suspect relationship between the cult and the local council. It's, these are these are things that are you know that are true and happen like a whole article about that would be great and I think where it probably comes from like you mentioned this narrative or idea that you had anything to do with it is is just because those two things were put together where it didn't seem it was almost like okay which which person are you trying to damage more Alex or Aaron <laughs> because you kind of did it to both and it's yeah. interesting that it wasn't something that she didn't did she tell you that she was doing the blog article no i didn't know until after it had published yeah she just asked you those details about it about when you're in scientology and then yeah. interestingly it sounds like she actually got those details wrong well i think because i think she asked me what years are you in i said 2011 to 2014 ah. and then i did my last essential course of 2018 and that's all i yeah you know, it's a very brief text exchange with those two questions and short answers she didn't say hey, can you tell me the specifics of why you're in or what you what years and all this? And I'm doing it like it was just, hey, what years are you in? And did you know Aaron? Yeah. I answer those questions. But, um, you know, I think that those are questions to ask Stephanie. I think mm -hmm. I'm the sort of person that I always try and look at the positive in people. I'm always yeah. kind of well-intentioned and I always try and, and this is quite often to my detriment, right? I try and look for the good in people. So my instinct is Stephanie probably was trying to help, right? She was trying to back me up in some way or support yeah. what I was doing. And I don't know what her intentions were, but that's kind of how I looked at it. And then it, it just didn't, it backfired. It didn't have the impact that I think she was expecting it to. Um, but I don't know that speculation. It would be a question yeah. for her. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Ambar is asking, do you think uh, Stephanie Hutchinson should be removed from the Aftermath Foundation? So she's on the board for people who don't know of the Aftermath Foundation. Yeah, I, th I think it's not my place to decide or comment on who is or isn't on the board of the Aftermath Foundation. That's, 
you know, that's a decision for the other board members. And it's not my place to, I like, I'm not someone who has the power or authority or any right to say who should or shouldn't be doing that stuff. Right. It's just not, it's not my place. Um, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can even tell from the comments here, somebody said the woman is unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is one thing that I really dislike about this whole saga is it's brought out the worst in so many people. Like mm -hmm. I have over the last two weeks had so many, like over the last year of speaking out, I've had a few hate comments and, you know, internet trolls and that sort of thing. But over the last two, three weeks specifically, like I daily get dozens of emails and comments on my YouTube videos telling me to unalive myself and that I'm lying about my story and that, um, you know, when I try to um end my life at the beginning of this whole trauma situation with Scientology which we didn't touch on earlier but that's one of the things that kicked off this rabbit hole of looking into Scientology for me it was I was in a, a really bad state and ended up in hospital um and you know people even comment saying you sh you should have like that you should have gone through with it or you should have carried on with like that would have been the best thing for everyone here like those horrible comments and saying this person's horrible and this person's doing this like it's just it's not helpful people are entitled to their own opinion yes absolutely and there's a place mm -hmm. for that and i encourage debate and discussion um but it's just it, it feels really vicious sometimes and i think that you can approach a conversation like we have done so far in sort of a, as a discussion as a debate yeah, rather exactly. than as an attack and that that's what is damaging to not just me but everybody is the attacks on Stephanie and attacks on me and attacks on Aaron you know everyone that's so vicious is it's just not in my opinion it's not helpful and I think we need to have a healthy debate rather than a vicious attack because there's no sides right that we're all trying to do the same thing there's no right way or wrong way to protest there's no better way to attack the problem that is scientology we all have our own way of doing it whether that's in la protesting or saint hill or you know writing a blog or doing youtube videos or even just commenting on youtube videos is helpful towards raising awareness and everyone's own take on things has merit and value and it's that multi-pronged attack that is going to help ultimately take down the church and stop the abuse and I think that's the way I look at it. And I just don't see how being vicious and telling me to unalive myself is helpful to any of that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Know? And that's what I want to stop is that viciousness. Yeah, I agree. There's no place for that anywhere. Why do you think that that has been happening in the last few weeks? I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you look at the last couple of weeks, it, you know, I have not changed anything that I'm doing other than like in terms of day to day, I went to Paris and all this sort of stuff. But you know, Aaron has done multiple videos that has, you know, said what he believes about me and Stephanie had her blog post and there's been a lot of other channels commenting and, and, and giving their opinions and that's all absolutely fine. There's no problem with that. But the impact that has is some of those videos or some of the blog posts, whatever, has attracted internet trolls and OSA trolls and all these other people who come out of the woodworks that are like the worst of the worst of the internet. And it's like attracted those small number of people to then go full on attack and full on vicious mode. Um, and like most of the videos that I've seen that are negative about me are, you know, one or two are quite vicious, but ultimately it's just, hey, this is what I believe and think about this guy. I don't like him. And that's fair. Like, that's OK. We don't have to be friends. Um, but the impact of that is certain people have then taken it upon themselves to then viciously and aggressively attack me, Stephanie, Aaron, everybody else in this community. And that's why I think it is. It's like it's a consequence of other stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a consequence, maybe, because that was I mean. What is it now? We're mid-April and it was end of March when the blog article came out. And I can see how that wouldn't do you any favors because it kind of just stirs things up the way that it was written and trying to pit two people against each other who are both doing their own thing yeah, and getting on with it. And you have you were saying you've addressed in your videos too questions that, as you mentioned, Aaron has done videos where he's questioned your, your background in Scientology and you've explained that and said, this is when I was in, this is what happened. What, why, it, because it's not specifically like even just, just Aaron, as you mentioned, there's this narrative, there's been this narrative around 
questioning your story. I've not seen that as much, you know, cause you know what it, it's, it's online. It's the internet, right? Anybody can say anything. Do you know what triggers that or what are your thoughts on why that gets, why, why that even gets pulled into question? I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. It's speculation, isn't it? You know, I mean, all I'm doing is focusing on my activism and my work and I've told my story and, you know, I, I don't know. I can't comment on why other people do different things. I don't, I don't know. I mean, if you look at um, Osa's response to my tactics and what I've been doing, you know, mm -hmm. the first statement they ever released ahead of the IS protest was their line was that I was only in for a few weeks and I'm trying to exploit my few weeks of participation in Scientology. And, you know, that was the statement they released to the press. And um, since then, they have issued more statements to the press in relation to articles I'd be working on with the Daily Mail and the Guardian and Observer and Newsweek and all of these big publications. And their line very much is that I'm a nobody and I'm not being honest about my story and I was only in for a few weeks. So, you know, I'm just trying to make money off my bigotry. Right. And I'm not saying that, you know, this attack that we're seeing in SPTV and stuff is like is OSA. I'm not suggesting that at all. But it's it's interesting that that's a similar narrative that they're trying to play. And um, I don't know where it came from. Um, but, you know, if you look at the first interview I did with Chris Shelton, where I told my story and you look at, you know, I, I summarized my story just now to you. I didn't go nearly in, as in depth as I did with Chris, but. Um, people have been saying things like my story doesn't add up and I've changed things, but um, not a single person has come to me and said what it is that's changed. Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or clear anything up that doesn't add up or, you know, but I, I've watched back my interviews and I can't see anything that has changed over time and no one has actually given any specifics. So, you know, if anyone does want to point out what's changed, in my story um you know please email me and 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 you know i'm happy to address that but it seems like a lot of these things are like oh you've done this and you've said this and you're making this up but you know i don't know where it's come from because yeah. my channel is about the activism and about stopping the abuse and i'm trying really hard to not make it about me and my story it's about the people currently suffering abuse at saint hill and trying to prevent further further suffering yeah Oh, I get that. Yeah. There was a question, in fact, about speaking of the Daily Mail. Kelly's asking, what feedback have you heard since the Daily Mail article dropped? I'm sure there was quite an upset behind the scenes with the cult. Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to comment because there are obviously ongoing legal things behind the scenes off the back of that. Um, but it was a double page spread. It was a feature um, that was in the Daily Mail about the corruption of East Grinstead Town Council and infiltration by Scientology and their safe pointing tactics. Um, it was a great piece by Sam Merriman, the journalist at the, the Mail. And I met with him last week and we discussed plans for a follow up and a bit of a strategy of different angles of attack. And he's really committed to helping raise awareness of um the abuse and the suffering and trying to put a stop to that and the the council was the, the first of hopefully many pieces and one of many angles of attack um there was a lot that was taken out of that article um you know for example i had 11 personal testimonies from people who had suffered abuse at saint hill mm. um give quotes and in interviews and that was all taken out by their legal team um so that's the sort of stuff going on behind the scenes that i'm trying i'm trying to work with journalists to get it on the front page that people are being harmed by this organization it's not just a crazy american cult it's a harmful organization yeah that's right we don't claim it solely here in america <laughs> <laughs> this is an international human trafficking yeah. cult <laughs> uh let's see i just asked that question uh, Anne is asking, how did your parents find out you joined staff and how did they react? Yeah, so I told my mum, hey, I'm... she knew I was going into Scientology to do courses and stuff after school um, while I was still studying. And then when I joined staff, I said, hey, you know, I'm going to work on staff and enjoy it. And she was like, OK, cool. I think she was nervous, I would imagine, because, you know, she would have heard stuff about Scientology. 
but also bear in mind this was before the debbie cook email like there was obviously there was stuff out there on the internet but back in the day you know people were still using blackberries to surf the web and there was you know the fastest internet you could get in the uk was like 20 or 50 megabytes or something a second like it was it was 2011 so it's not like the dark ages but it was there was still a, a, the information available was still very limited so she was concerned obviously but i think also if you are confronted with somebody like your child who is very quickly being indoctrinated by a cult i can imagine she was in a place where she didn't feel like she could confront me about stuff because i'm just going to attack and there's that fear of disconnection i don't know if she knew about disconnection but if she did i would imagine that was a fear as well um so i don't know but that would be a question to ask my mum. yeah that'd be a good question <laughs> what did you think about it <laughs> yeah I'm working on that with my mum. So I would really like to do an interview with her because I have i haven't really spoken to her much about the whole Scientology era. Um, and I'm I'm hoping to get her on my channel at some point, but it's difficult because of her job and speaking out publicly is, is an, um, a delicate subject. Yeah, I would agree with that. Marilyn Honig has a question. Alex, are you planning to do a fundraiser for the Aftermath Foundation as stated back in October since you received 10,000 subs? Yeah, absolutely. I could do that. I mean, I've just been focused on, you know, trying to do what I can to raise awareness. And yeah, I don't see any problem with doing a fundraiser. I mean, at the moment, I think there's a lot of division and attacks about whether you support the aftermath or whether you support the SPTV Foundation. And my viewpoint is that you can support both. You don't have to support mm -hmm. one or the other, you know, and you don't have to be friends. You know, I have my own personal disagreements with Aaron, but that doesn't mean I don't support him and his work and his foundation. Mm -hmm. And I, at the moment, feel like it's probably not the best move to do a fundraiser on my channel for either, because if I was to do a fundraiser for the Aftermath right now, I'm sure that would invoke a response of like, oh, you're siding with Mark, Mike and Claire and you're on that team and not on Aaron's team. And, you know, I feel like it's not the smartest move to do a fundraiser right now, um, but I'm sure that it will be appropriate at some point. But in the meantime, if anyone wants to donate to the Aftermath or the SPTV foundations, go to the websites and donate there. And um, there's nothing stopping people donating. Yeah, definitely. Definitely not. And even if you did a fundraiser, you could just split it down the middle. <laughs> Zenu Golf Club. Let's see here. Where am I? Adana. Uh, question. Ask Ask Alex re LA protesters. Well, what about it though? What about it, Donna? Are you familiar with the LA protests? Yeah, I mentioned it earlier. I said it's great. And I think the more people speaking out and doing the activism, the better. I mean, some people have asked, why am I not talking about it on my channel? And that's because my channel is focused on the fight here in the UK and Europe, but that doesn't mean I don't support it. Um, yeah. You know, I mentioned it earlier. I've mentioned it in other interviews. I think it's great work. And, you know, there are different uh, uh, different approaches to protesting and there's no right way or wrong way. And there's every way has merit. And, you know, there are protests aimed at stopping people walking into the building. There are protests aimed at, you know, raising awareness about help that's available if people want to leave who are currently in Scientology. There's, you know, protests about the IRS tax exemption, all of that. Like, they're all different types of protests, and they all are valuable and helpful. And the more people we have doing it in the more cities around, excuse me, around the world, the better. Yep, definitely. I just wish there were more people in the UK doing it because uh, there's only a handful of us. Yeah, that would be. And I bet there will be, too. I absolutely see that very much growing. And even over there, because people see it. I know here they see what the protesters are doing and it has encouraged and inspired a lot of people. Even people, so many, the vast majority of people protesting have never been in Scientology. And I find that fascinating because I could see that connection being made with the experience that people had in Scientology because, you know, trauma People who've been through trauma understand, like understand the effects of that because it's a, even though the experiences aren't exactly the same, it's somewhat of a shared experience. So hopefully it'll also grow too. I totally thought that, uh, I, I totally think that it will across there. That'd be really neat to see. I mean, we had about, I think it was 46 or 48, like about 50 protesters at the IES event last year. Yeah, and that great. was only organized four weeks ahead of time. So mm -hmm. um, I fully expect the IES protests this year to be larger. Um, you know, more people are finding the confidence to speak out 
online and speak out in the UK. And I've done a lot of work raising awareness in and around East Grinstead. So I imagine, um, yeah, there'll be a much larger support network. But we don't have to wait for the IS event to go protest. Anyone yeah. can go and stand outside Norg any day of the week and do their thing. And I, I encourage that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Another question here. Joel, what happened to your foundation, Alex? Sure. Like, I mean, if... Yeah. So if you, I mean, Joel, I would advise you go and look on my channel and watch the videos where I've talked about it. So back in, I think it was May or around May, I came up with the idea of starting a UK sort of foundation that not that, that's not in competition with the aftermath, like it doesn't help people escape and leave, but provides peer support and resources and all this sort of stuff that, um, it can help anyone anywhere on their recovery journey and started doing a bunch of research and asking people about their experiences and what was helpful to them in their healing and recovery journey. Um, and the whole idea is this UK foundation will work across not just Scientology, but all or, or as many cults and coercive groups as possible. So there's a lot of research going into it. I'm trying to build a resource hub, which is like a website where people can go and find resources and it redirects you to different support options and charities or um, you know, directs you to Facebook groups or YouTube videos or all of the stuff that's already out there. It just kind of helps people find stuff a bit easier that might yeah, be helpful yeah. to them. Um, so that's a mammoth task because there's a lot of information out there and to try and categorize it in a way that's easy to flow through and understand in a way that's helpful, you know, and create support guides and stuff is, is a long, a long task. Um, but we had our first board meeting last week and we're starting to shape together our governing document, which is the legally binding document, which I don't know how it works in the U S but in the UK, your there's a public benefits test if you're a charity and so you have to prove that you're providing a benefit to the general public every single year and that assessment is based on what you put in your governing document and if you are not achieving what you put out in your governing document every year you lose your tax exemption um so it's really important you get that governing document right so we had our first board meeting last week um and we're now starting to shape what that's going to look like as a legal document and when we're ready we'll register and i'll tell everyone about it that's exciting. So there will be a foundation then in the UK where people can go to for help with leaving Scientology. Yeah, I mean, look, it's not we're absolutely not helping people escape and leave like the SPTV Foundation and the Aftermath Foundation do a great job at that. It's not in competition. It's specifically to help people with peer support and providing resources for leaving cults and coercive groups, um, you know, whether that be directing them to educational materials or, you know, going into schools and teaching um, students on the dangers of cults or whether that's yeah. working with psychologists and counselors and educating them on the dangers and the methods of coercive control and cult like we're still shaping exactly what that looks like but it's kind of all that stuff rather than helping people escape and leave because there's already charities that do that and do it well yeah and i think that we definitely there should be more and can be more because there's so many different people who have different reasons why they join Scientology and they leave for different reasons and have different experiences and the more different organizations that can help and definitely having them more local to them, even though there's two foundations right now here in the United States to have another one in over in the UK. Like there's, I feel like there's so much room for all of it because there's so much need. And, that, and to your point, that because I, I think about I think about that a lot too. You know, even my channel, Scientology Life After a Cult. But for me, I really have a desire to shine a light on all cult all cults. Mm. I'm just busy with Scientology right now. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're doing. We're, we're going to, as a as a foundation or a charity or whatever, we want to start with Scientology because that's what we know so well. Um, mm -hmm. But the plan is to get the Scientology resources up there so that we can get started quicker and then start looking at other cults. You know, there's Jehovah's Witnesses, there's Mormons and other extremist non-religious cults and MLMs and stuff. Like, it's a whole wealth of stuff. And, you know, hopefully we can build partnerships with the existing charities that are out there and we can all support each other other because you know it, there's no one place that's going to be the only and the right solution for everybody um and it's all about working as a team to provide the resources that each charity can provide in their own special way so mm -hmm. i'm all about like collaboration and working together and all that yeah and the more people being able to help different you know there's so many when you get into other cults too that's just a whole nother area 
But from my limited experience with other cults and speaking to people who have been in other cults, the similarities are just crazy how yeah. similar. And the tactics that are used as well are so, so similar. So I think you'll be able to, if you know, doing that out there, be able to help a lot of people. Yeah, like pulling in the, the help and resources where needed. Like, you know, I'm not an expert in mental health or a counselor or you know there's there's knowledge that we as board members have and i will announce the board when the time is right but like i've got a decent group of people who have a multitude of experiences that you know who some are former scientologists some are not and don't have any cult experience but have charity experience you know but mm -hmm. the the ability to pull on the help of other people so saying like hey we need a, a counselor or a therapist to come and advise us on how we can best support therapists in educating them about quasi control or whatever um that's the whole idea is like you know being honest about what we know and what we don't know and getting in that help where necessary yep that's very true very but it's true. very early days it's going to take months because it's already taken months and it will take several more months because it's important that we get it right and i don't want to launch a foundation that's kind of okay and helps a little bit but it's not i want it to be effective from day one with a really well thought out support guide resource hub and instantly start helping people um so and also because of the public benefit test and the way charity law works here it's really important you get that stuff right from day one so we're taking our time over it because um it's important to get it right and also it's voluntary so everyone involved on the board has their own full-time job and <laughs> you know yeah. it's it's not something that we're working on full-time because we just don't have the capacity to do that yeah, that makes sense. There's so much, there's just so many different ways that people can get involved in exposing Scientology and getting the word out. What would you say to somebody who wanted to get started, maybe say protesting Scientology? I would ask, well, firstly, I would ask, what's your message? Like, what, why are you protesting? Are you protesting to try and stop people joining or walking in? Are you protesting to send a message to people currently in Scientology? Because that messaging is very different. Um, are you protesting their tax exemption? You know, because then protesting outside Scientology might not be as effective as protesting outside the IRS or the mm. HMRC here in the UK. Or like, So first of all, think about your purpose. What's your message? Why are you protesting? Um, and then just extrapolate from that. You know, what, well, how do you think that's going to be most effective? You know, I would say cover your butt and, and know the laws and your rights and what you can and can't do and try and keep it respectful and peaceful and um, you know, kindness is something and compassion is really important, I think, in any type of protest. And just do what you think is right, you know, and, and the way that you feel is going to be most effective in protesting. There's no right or wrong way. I'm not the authority on how to protest. You know, it's it's what you feel is right and what you think is the right thing to do. I can't tell you how to protest. But, you know, that was what I would say is think about your message and know your laws and be nice. <laughs> Rawson's asking, would you would Alex be open to a video with AA Ron? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've you know, Aaron stopped replying to my text six months ago um and ignored, you know, maybe 10 or 15 different video ideas about stuff in the past. So I think he's made it very clear he doesn't want to do a video with me. But you know, I'm the sort of person that puts personal differences aside for the sake of you know, combating the cult and raising awareness and exposing the abuse. And I don't think you have to be friends with someone in order to make a video about abuse that's going on um, or making a video about protesting or about the fraud investigation that's currently going on here in the UK that I've been working on and the charity commission who are investigating Narcon on all of that stuff. If Aaron wants to do a video about it, absolutely. He knows how to reach me. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about what you that first one you were talking about, the fraud investigation. Yeah, so I wrote to my local member of parliament um, back in September, um, just asking for advice. And I said, hey, um, you know, what what can you do to support me as my local representative in this issue? Um, and my local MP happens to be Diane Abbott, who is she's a very divisive political figure. Some people love her, some people hate her. She was the first black female elected um, member of parliament in British history. She's also the most abused member of parliament. She gets, I think it's something like 50 percent of all hate directed at female MPs is directed directed specifically at her so she has dealt for 
you know, 40, almost 40 years um, with constant harassment and bullying from all different angles and racism and so on. Um, so actually, coincidentally, I think she's quite well placed to deal with fair game and Scientology. But I contacted her because she was my MP and she's the first port of call. And I just said, hey, what can you do? And she wrote back to me to my surprise and said, hey, so... Uh, thank you for your letter. Um, I have requested HMRC, which is the IRS of the UK, um, investigate Scientology for their fraud and will do X, Y and Z um, to chase this up. And I've since met with her and her secretary a handful of times. I'm in regular contact with her and with her secretary on different avenues of approach. Um, and yeah, we're looking into things like the minimum wage and how Scientology don't pay their staff. We're looking at the Modern Slavery Act and how SEAL members aren't allowed to leave St. Hill without permission. And that kind of falls into modern slavery in the UK law and you know tra trafficking and that sort of stuff. We're looking at taxes and fraud and like she's a massive champion. And we're now moving into the phase of approaching other members of parliament and getting them on board to support um, the cause and so that it becomes hopefully a debate in parliament but we'll see yeah do you think that the response that you get when you speak to your local elected officials mm -hmm. how do you think that stacks up compared to here in the united states there 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 is a mix they're usually a bit more on the conservative side of not saying too much some will will outright say yes i think there needs to be somebody needs to look into Scientology's tax exempt status. When you reach out to those government leaders there in the UK, do you think it's a similar response or do they see more? Cause it's different there in the United States. Scientology has their tax exempt status, which gives them a lot of clout with what they can do. They often, they hide a lot behind religious protections. Mm -hmm. And what is that like in the UK? How do they respond? Do you think it's similar or different? Um, I mean, I can't compare them because I've never contacted a US elected official. But what I can say from my experience in the UK is I've been quite surprised um, in a positive way. Scientology are not tax exempt here. Um, they were rejected charity status in 1999 because they couldn't prove that they have a public benefit. Mm -hmm. But they do have some minor tax e exemption in terms of like their business property taxation because they're classed as places of public worship. So it's a very complicated system. But essentially, when I speak to MPs and government officials, um, they initially their response is, oh, Scientology is this crazy American cult that aren't really here doing anything in the UK. There's not many of them. Why do I bother? So like what is not worth my time or effort? So I spend a lot of time educating people mm -hmm. um, and government officials on why it's an important issue. And how, yes, there might not be many Scientologists, but they hold a lot of money and power. And they are literally abusing people right now here in the UK and elsewhere. But like once they get the point that it's not just a crazy American cult, it is an abusive, harmful organization, then suddenly they're a little bit more interested. And then you throw in there the fraud and you say, hey, look, if you look over the last 10 years, if they'd have paid all of their UK staff minimum wage, oh, that geez. means they would have paid... I can't remember the figure, but it was something like 300 million pounds in income tax. Whoa. So actually they haven't paid that. Then suddenly there is perk up because that's a huge amount of money that they're scamming the government out of. Um, don't quote me on that exact number. I don't have it in front of me, but it's something of that size. Yeah. It's yeah, huge. That's huge. Um, so it's just like trying to figure out what it is that, that will interest them and make it click with them as to why it's important. And then suddenly they're interested. Yeah. It does sound like it's similar in ways, but almost like because there's that that kind of major difference with how the United States is a bit more loosey goosey with certain things when it comes to religion. In the United States, they won't even they don't say, "Oh, that is a religion. That is not a religion." They're not even supposed to. The government's not supposed to say they can grant a tax exempt status, but there's no real like you are now a church. You know, you are a valid this or that. It's supposed to be kind of separate from you know yeah. the church and state thing. It's kind of the same in the UK, like there isn't a religion recognizing authority, but it, the, the the charity law states that even if you are a religion, that doesn't mean you're tax exempt. You have to prove that whatever your religious beliefs, you're benefiting the public. How does practicing your religion help the wider community? Um, and that public benefits test is really important here in the UK. And Scientology weren't able to pr prove that the practice of Scientology helps the wider public. So they were rejected tax status. We also don't have a constitution. So that religious protection thing is a lot more 
convoluted because our legal system is based on a thousand years of history um and kings and queens and laws that are you know hundreds of years old that have evolved and adapted over time so it's a lot more nuanced i think um it's not as clear cut as the the us yeah i would think so too i've been very curious about that about what it's like the difference with the differences in protesting here when it happens because I tell people all the time on my channel, you need to find out what the laws are in your state, in your area, in your country, and often even in your city, because they can change. There can be ordinances in Los Angeles and different ones in New York, and you need to know what the differences are. Is it pretty consistent in, you know, in the UK as a whole, or do you see that that kind of changes or it only changes like when you go out of the country, for example, like the protests in Paris? Yeah, I mean, so so UK law is pretty standard. There are separate parliament, like there's devolution. So there's Wales and Scotland have their own parliaments with slightly different laws. But ultimately, um, most kind of laws are, are the same wherever you are in the UK. Um, and I think there's the cultural difference as well as the legal difference. You know, in France, they the police were a lot more aggressive and they're a lot more vicious, um, not necessarily because of Scientology, but just because that was their that's their nature and that's the way their police was, was set up. Um, you know, Scientology is considered a cult in France. It's not protected by the government in any way, but the yeah. police were a little bit more vicious. You know, here in the UK, um, all the police that I've dealt with, because I've spent time developing relationships with the police ahead of the protests, so like my the IES protest and my protest in London that I organised for the March 13th birthday, um, uh, LRH's birthday, I like, my approach was to contact the police and say hey i'm going to protest this is the plan you know this is how many people i'm expecting to show up and you know we want to keep it peaceful and working with them so that it's not a surprise when it happens and building a relationship and that has actually been really beneficial because then they show up and they support us on the day in helping us demonstrate our right to to protest um that's a bit harder when you do impromptu protests every day outside an org because it's just yeah. not feasible i've only organized one-off protests that are for specific events um so yeah i don't know and in paris there was where and correct me if i have it wrong there there they need a permit to protest yeah but none of the permits were none of the permits approved to protest scientology for the paris opening I don't know where that came from because we did have a protest permit and it was approved and it was we had a demonstration area that was all approved by the local government and it was all signed off and we initially started off somewhere else but we were moved to the designated protest area on the day. Oh, I get it. So instead they didn't approve it for right in front of the the org but down down the road a bit. <laughs> Yeah, I think multiple people applied for protest permits and because one had already been granted, the others were denied. Um, yeah. So I have a feeling that maybe some, one, what, someone who had their protest permit denied spoke to someone and said they denied the protest permit. Um, but it's not true that there wasn't one. Like someone else applied and it was granted and it was we were given a designated area and that's where we ended up on the day. Mm. And that it seemed like it went like it went well. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, a little bit of the videos from it. It was interesting, to say the least. Um, as I said, the police were very aggressive and Scientology were very aggressive and uh, very definitely had, I had a target on my back the whole day. Um, yeah. But How it was fun. Give me an example, like paint a picture. What was that like when you say Scientology was very aggressive? Yeah, so like one of the journalists from one of the national French newspapers came up to me and he was speaking to the police and mm -hmm. he was like, hey, Alex, like the police have made it very clear. You're the problem. Like it's not the protest. It's not everyone else. Like you're the one that is causing all this issue. I'm like, what? I'm just live streaming. I'm not even protesting. I'm just holding my camera up, walking around. Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, I know. But essentially, Scientology were calling up the police and saying that we were harassing people and being violent and, you know, all of this stuff that you'd expect from Scientology. Um, and they had taken pictures. I had someone following me pretty much the whole day, videoing and filming and photographing my actions. And um, so they would get specific shots of me where I'm mid saying something, where I look like I'm shouting or something. And they yeah. would send that to the police and they would say, see, look, he's shouting at us. Yeah. And so that's the sort of tactics that they played to make it look like I was being really aggressive. And so the police responded accordingly. Uh, <laughs> just kind of setting it up that way. That aggressive guy over there that we're not catching on video being aggressive, <laughs> being very aggressive. <laughs> exactly. It's silly.
Oh, there's a question here. Let's see. Where did it go? Here we go. Um, maybe this was about the film crew. Alex said on a live stream recently that David Miscavige was so impressed with the amount of books he was selling that he sent a film crew to London to film him. What did he film exactly? Yeah. So, um, Rachel Hastings, who has spoken out before, she worked for SMP, Scientology Media Productions. Um, we did an interview on my channel. I'd suggest you go and find it. It was quite funny. We were talking about the time that she was sent by Miscavige from SMP or Gold, as it was at the time, to yeah. come and film me and the Div 6 crew at Tottenham Court Road selling books. And it was quite funny because, you know, yes, we were smashing it at the birthday game. I've actually still, I don't know where it is, somewhere. I don't have his hand, but I still have my graph of stats from book sales from that time. Um, but yeah, so we were smashing it. Yes. And we won the birthday game. We we're doing really good. But that's still like only a couple of hundred books a week. Like it's not like the place was busy all day, every day. So yeah. we had to fake it and like try and get people off the street. Hey, we're making a film. Can you come and sit in in our building just for a few minutes so we can make it look busy? Um, and then it was played at the birthday game event and, and all of that. But um, yeah, Rachel and I did a video about it um, a couple of months ago. Oh, that's neat. So she was in Scientology with someone that actually did this with the filming and then she left and then you were able to talk about it afterwards. Yeah. So she worked at SMP over in LA and she's in, she was in the Sea Org. She still is over in, in LA. Um, mm -hmm. And she started speaking out. She worked closely with Mitch Brisker and, um, you know, it came up in conversation once and we realized that she was the one responsible for filming that birthday game video that Miscavige sent to come and capture all the great work we're doing expanding scientology um and it's just funny that like we connected yeah so many years after and it it still just blows my mind too because i try to think back at my time in scientology and when i i was a horrible recruiter i worked in in division six for a while and you know well at that time i hadn't done i, I considering how much scientology i did on the processing side i never had that desire to like get people into Scientology or get it into their hands. And I would say in the beginning, there's beginning things in Scientology that are universal truths. So sometimes you do those and you get some wins out of those and you keep going. But you were, what you're saying is very, very productive in, in selling these books and all that without having that other side of it. it just based mostly on it sounds like, because it was what you felt was would gain you acceptance within the group to have that, yeah. that relationship. And, and just naivety, you know, I was a teenager. I wasn't an adult yet. I was a child. So the naivety of all these people saying, hey, sell this book because it helps people and you want to help people, right? And this is going to help clear the planet and we're going to achieve great things together. Yeah. The more people we get on board with this, the better life is going to be for everybody. And when you're a vulnerable, naive child, you're going to go, okay what you know i trust what these grown-ups are saying and it's like yeah. you're having a good time right like we're all friends and we're nice and we're happy and like you know what's the harm and i'm like well there isn't any harm in selling someone a book but what you don't realize is the way you sell the book you know with stress tests and all that is um manipulation and control and um you know invading someone's privacy it's a horrible thing to do to somebody but i didn't realize that's what i was doing at the time um now i do and there's an element of wanting to make amends for that i help people get into scientology and now i feel like it's important to help people get out but ultimately i think it's just the right thing to do if i've got a small window of opportunity to raise awareness about what's currently going on in scientology and you know i had my traumatic and abusive experience but it's nowhere near as bad as other people have had it you know children who are raised in scientology people who were in the hole in la people who were close to miscavige and got physically beaten like all of this stuff is far worse than the experience that i had and it's important that if i have a small opportunity to you know shine a light on that and raise awareness and try and do what i can to stop it um, I'm going to do it. It's just the right thing to do. And the more people that join in that, the better. Um, and I really want more UK people to speak out because there aren't enough of us here um, doing the activism work. I mean, people have spoken out before and there's a long history of people supporting the cause and raising awareness in the UK. I'm not the first person to do it at all. Um, but, you know, there's not many people now currently being activists on YouTube and online and and doing it full time. So, I welcome anybody to come and join me and take a bit of the workload off me. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, we definitely need more of that. And there's more and more all the time. I was chatting with Tori Magoo 44 earlier, and she had her list of all the different live streamers and how much it had changed since, I mean, even just recently, there's more all the time. So I'm sure it's going to grow. Uh, one person had a question, O'Neill, which begs the question, why did your parents allow this? As you keep pointing out, you were a child, 15. It's not exactly a youth club you were popping into. It sounds like in the UK, is it different? Because here in the US, you couldn't be on staff. Like you can't sign a, a, a contract is not enforceable if it's signed by a minor. You need to have a parent sign off on it. But they held you. It seems like Scientology also held you to that contract. How does that work in the UK? I mean, so again, they dodge the laws around this, but you're considered yeah. a religious volunteer and therefore it's not really a contract because you're not really employed, but actually you are. And in UK law, even if you're working for a religious organization or for a charity, if you have a job title, you have obligations, you have duties and office and all of this, and you, you are obligated to work, then you are um, entitled legally um, to receive the national minimum wage. But Scientology don't look at it like that and they try and consider you as a religious volunteer. So your employment contract is actually a religious spiritual commitment. Um, but yeah, they, they get around it in whatever ways that they they do. You know, they're slimy, coercive cult, right? Let's not forget that. Yeah. It's not a normal business that operates by the rules. Um, yeah. As for my mum, I can't speak to that. You know, I would suggest that's a question for her. But that's her choice if she wants to speak out publicly. And I doubt that she will because of her job and, and other things. But yeah. I will do what I can to bring her on my channel if I can. Did they when you when you were on staff and selling books, you mentioned the manipulation. Did they train you? Because I know in Scientology, like, you know, back when I was on staff and working in Division six there, you had to do the drills on book selling, but on finding people's ruin. Is that yeah. something that you were trained to do in Scientology? Yeah, absolutely. You just got real, real good at doing the drills and selling the books. I would imagine too, being younger, it's that, you know, just that enthusiasm about it, I feel like would be larger. Yeah. And, and it being the, all of the stuff that you're looking for that you missed in your childhood, you know, that yeah. sense of belonging, that sense of this is a purpose. This is going, I finally, I feel like. I'm somewhere stable, I'm valued, and I feel like, you know, people aren't dying left, right, and center because I do, dealt with a lot of loss and grief and all of that in my upbringing. And so it was all of that wrapped up in, in one simple solution. Hey, we can help you with whatever problem that you have. So then when it came to my turn to train to recruit people, it was, you know, I got it because it was like, you know, you just present it as a solution. But now I know it's it does more harm than good. And I wasn't helping people, even though I thought I was. Yeah, that is that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes is, you know, going through when you're there in the moment and in Scientology, you're not thinking about it. I keep saying people in Scientology don't know that they were that they are in a cult. <laughs> yeah. If they knew they would not be there. And so much of it. I don't know about you, but I know the longer I've been out of Scientology, the more my eyes have opened to actions, things that went on that were very culty that at the time, and even shortly after leaving Scientology, I didn't see that way. It, yeah. it, it just took a while to be able to see it for really what it was. It took about eight or nine years, maybe 10 years for me to even Google Scientology after leaving. Like, that's how wow. in-depth it is because you know when you're the, my therapist explained it to me like this i mean i'm not a mental health expert so i'm only reiterating what they said to me but it was something along the lines of your brain doesn't actually stop growing and developing until you're in your mid-20s which is where i am now um you know i'm only 28 so my brain is probably towards the end of its major forming um you know development stage your brain still grows and develops over age but like forming neural pathways happens all through your teenage years and your early to mid 20s so the damage scientology does to a child is greater than the damage it does to an adult if someone's in for a small period of time so this is what my therapist said was if you were in for two years as a 50 year old or two years as a 15 year old, the damage is going to be greater for the 15 year old because they're still developing neural pathways and Scientology is developed to program your brain to think in a certain way. So therefore the damage is longer lasting. Um, and so, yeah, it took me a long time to even realize the, the damage it was doing. And ultimately that led to an attempt to 
um you know unalive myself and that started the rabbit hole that of like finding out what this thing is and finding out there are people who had it far worse and now i want to raise awareness and say hey guys irrespective of personal disagreements you can choose to believe me or not believe me about my story for me it doesn't matter what's important is we're all trying to help people leave and raise awareness that people are being abused right now right and if you're in the us and you're a us taxpayer you're subsidizing that <laughs> you're subsidizing the abuse because it's tax exempt in the us so it's absolutely vitally important that we do what we can to raise awareness and you know revoke their tax exemption protest scientology stop people joining and hold scientology to account for the damage it does to people's lives yep absolutely absolutely well i appreciate you being here and answering questions going over it and even the whole stephanie hutchinson thing few people asked about that in the chat we did talk about that early on so you're just going to have to catch it on the replay but it sounds like if there's any more questions or anything, you are more happy, more than happy to just answer them. Yeah. I mean, I get like, I kid you not, like probably about 100 emails a day. So please do bear in mind, if you do email me, I will get back to you, but it might take me a couple of weeks. I'm currently about, I think, a month or six weeks behind on my emails. So please, if you're, I haven't responded to you, I'm not ignoring you. I just like I'm struggling to keep up with everything right now. Um, and it's all very overwhelming and it's taking over my life and I'm struggling, but I will do my best. But please do, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer and email me. And please know that my channel is a place where I'm talking about the activism, giving people a platform to speak about their experiences. It's not a place where I'm going to do videos commenting on other creators and all of this. Like it's a very narrow focus. Um, that doesn't mean I don't support that debate and discussion, but my channel is not where you're going to find that content because that's not what my channel is about. Um, but I'm more than happy to go on other channels that are focusing on that and the commentary and stuff like great. I encourage that and I'm more than happy to speak to anybody. Um, you know, Scientology Business, my blog where I'm reporting on the UK and European activities and, um, you know, fraud and finances and legal affairs, all that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, hello at apostatealex.com is my email address. That sounds good. That sounds good. Learn something new every day. Thank you for becoming a member on the channel. Hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> uh, Ken's channel. Thank you so much for the super chat. Great interview. Alec makes, makes a great point about damage to younger people. Great work in the UK. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, I'm the youngest like ex-Scientologist on SPTV. So I don't always get it right. I'm still learning. Yes, I'm an adult, but I'm, you know, I'm only 28. So I think, you know, I'm, I've still got a lot of learning and development to do, and I'm still trying to I'm just trying to do my best. So um, I welcome all the feedback and comments and I will continue to do what I think is right to raise awareness. All right. Well, thank you again so much for being here. Everybody thank else, thank you as well for being here. Please be sure to hit that like button on your way out. And yeah, we are, it's, well, I probably don't have another video today. <laughs> you must be knackered. It seems like you've been live all day. <laughs> I know. This is my third one. My back does hurt. I'm going to definitely need a massage and a foam roller. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Very jealous. I need, I need a better chair. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Alex. Everybody else, uh, head over. I know that uh, there's probably multiple people live right now. I didn't check. I meant to check to see so we could give you some ideas, but go hit that live button on YouTube and see who's live and check it out. Alex, thank you again. Everybody, I hope y'all just get out and have an amazing cult-free day.